adjustments to the agenda. We're going to move um, the school calendar 11.2 and then the action at 12.1 up for executive session. Um, Reports. So right after the reports, um, anybody have any other adjustments they need? Um, approve a um, minutes of Wednesday, March 16th. No move. Second. Is there any discussion on the March 16th minutes? All right, hearing none, so move. Um, any board correspondence communications anybody needs to share? Um, okay, moving on. Moving right along. Did she just put something in the chat? Oh, she told me. Oh. Yeah. Public comments. Is there any public on? Hi. Hi. My name is Michelle Sama. Um, I have a public comment if you're ready for it. Sure. Um, so my um, commentary is pertaining to item 11 that's on your agenda, the uh, COVID vaccines in the K through 12 schools in the SU. Um, you know, I just wanted to give my um, opinion and input on the matter. Uh, the vaccine board, the Vermont vaccine board, I think is scheduled to meet in May. Um, and as some of you probably know, that's who makes the decisions about what shots are um, required in our K through 12 schools. Um, and I guess one of my concerns is the, the atmosphere in our schools is such that it's gonna be a hard sell if um, you know they do come and um, mandate the vaccines. And I am in favor of them mandating them, but, um, and I can explain those reasons. I just feel as though the atmosphere we've got going on right now is not conducive towards, um, you know, mitigation strategies or um, preventing COVID in the K through 12 environment. Uh, the higher education in Vermont has uh, mandated the vaccines and had great success. Um, much of the education went without huge interruptions. There were definitely some issues. But I feel like there's adequate data out there that shows that vaccines work. I think we should still be pushing for them within our schools. And, um, you know, I hope that the school could continue some communications around um, vaccinations and um, just COVID-19 in general, so that if the vaccination board does approve this as one of the mandatory vaccines that, um, you know, we don't have a lot of pushback within the community. Thank you. Thank you. And is that, is that the only public comment? Hi, I must have a public comment on the same thing. Can you hear me? I don't know my microphone's on. Yep. Okay. Um, I'm Brad Morrill Cornelius. Um, I have two kids in the school. Um, I'm also a critical care nurse. Uh, my first COVID patient um, died um, February 25th of 2020. I've been working with COVID patients since then. Um, I feel like mandated vaccines in the school is for staff is necessary, especially with the um, masking mandates coming down. Um, Early on in 2020, I left the safety of Vermont and went to New York when their uh, caseload was um, um, exploding and ended up working in a 450-bed hospital on Long Island. Um, we saw a lot of people um, die of this. Um, it was evident to us then that it was mutating very quickly because week after week, the president presentations were changing. Um, we are lucky now that we have vaccines that um, it's apparent to me um, and, um, are effective even against the new um, <clears throat> mutations that are coming out and Omicron isn't going to be the last one. We will have another wave. Um, we know this. Um, <clears throat> recently um, had the opportunity to speak to a patient to um, 
ended up in our ICU, vented um, for over four months. Um, he was one of the few I've seen that actually pulled through and was able to speak to us afterwards. Um, and I was giving him a um, rectal suppository that he needed. And once they're able to talk, we like to give them their autonomy back and let them be part of the decision-making process. And I explained to him why he needed this medication and why it had to be given the way we were giving it. And um, he looks at me and says, well, it's not comfortable, but if I were the smartest person in this room, I wouldn't be in this bed. So um, referring to the fact that he uh, refused the vaccine initially. Um, I'm lucky that I'm in a field where I'm on my third round of vaccines and in a few months probably we'll get a fourth. Um, over the last eight or nine months or so, all of our patients um, that we've received have been unvaccinated. We don't see any who are vaccinated. Um, and I feel like it's important because this is our children's population. Not all of the children in the school can be vaccinated. Um, it's important that our staff members are vaccinated um, to protect our, protect our children and protect the community. Thank you. Thank you. We like caller number two. Yeah. Um, we have a call in number ending in seven six. <clears throat> you just let me know who you are and if not a board member. Do you have a public comment? Star six. Star six. Star six. Oh, sorry about that. Let me see if I can stop that noise. So this is Camille Olmsted. I'm a long time member of this community. I'm also assisting in the school right now uh, because of the COVID tracing that was required at the um, nursing uh, level. Um, I've been retired for two years. I was a health administrator with the Veterans Administration. And it seems to me that it's important that we realize that there are several tools in our toolbox to deal with this pandemic, which is not over with even though we're all sick to death of it. Um, those tools include vaccination, they include masks, and they include, I don't wanna see the schools close again. It's very important that the kids are, are in the school, active, able to speak to each other, able to see their teachers. So I feel that um, it's super important that we encourage people to vaccinate, and um, even wear masks if that's what we need to do to stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Is that it, right? For public, yeah. Okay. All right, and that's our public comments, guys. So we are on to the superintendent's report. Um, so you all have my report in hand. Um, we're uh, we're gearing up. Millers will go out for uh, Rochester, Stockbridge, Granville, Hancock, and um, First Branch very soon. Tara's been working on that along uh, with uh, the principals and Kate and board chairs. So those those will go out soon. We have uh, three votes in May. Um, so I just wanted to add that to my report. Otherwise, I think I've captured almost everything in it. Um, other than I did have a great meeting with Phil Gore of the VSBA. Uh, he's the new trainer. And uh, we met on Thursday. And uh, he is scheduled to attend our um, April, May, June meetings uh, to finish out our board training series. So I'm looking forward to that. And then just a reminder to board chairs, I had Christy White uh, register us for the annual mandatory board chair superintendent trainings. Um, and those um, begin here at the end of this, or this, yeah, the end of April uh, as well. So you should have that registration in your email. If you don't, please email me and I'll make, I'll track down what happened, but I, you should have that in your email inbox. Um, and then um, I'll take any questions folks have. Go ahead, Bill. Um, I have a question that's, uh, 
accommodation to our superintendent um, and is proactive uh, reaching out to Phil Gore, who is the new development director for Vermont School Board Association. Since I've been a director, um, it, uh, I've had to catch up a lot. So I've read maybe a dozen books or manuals about um, effective school board governance. And one of the best books that I read was co-authored by Phil Gore, who's the gentleman that's going to be joining us. Uh, this is his book here. And um, since we're going to be seeing him in public, we probably don't have to read his book, but I strongly recommend um, it's readable. It's uh, uh, He's got great chapters and it's called Improving School Board Effectiveness. A balanced governance approach, um, and he did this as part of the the, the publishing is is Harvard um, University. This guy knows what he's talking about. He's been out there, and he speaks to if we're going to have sound, effective schools, it takes more than our superintendent, the superintendent's teams, the best and brightest teachers. Um, the whole staff's going along with the supporters that it takes effective leadership at the board level and that's his specialty and I think all of us when I certainly read this had a lot to learn about what does it take to be an effective board what does it take to be an effective board member how do we measure that um, shouldn't we be taking that seriously um, as part of our governance responsibilities so I look forward to a meeting with him, I strongly recommend that we utilize Phil to the best, not only at the SU level, but at each of our uh, six boards. And again, uh, Jamie, I want to uh, really appreciate your reaching out to him because uh, he can make a difference. And to the extent that he helps educate us, we can make more of a difference in a positive way. So thank you very much. Anything else for Jamie? Yeah, I have a question. Um, Jamie, do you know what the um, topics are going to be for th that Phil's going to? Thanks, Bill. I think that's really interesting. I look, I'll look at that book. But what else he's going to talk about on uh, in April, May, and June? Yeah, so uh, April was going to be board uh, protocols and procedures. Uh, was April in May is going to be uh, mission visioning work. Oh, good. And June was on policy development and monitoring thanks and then we did talk about then uh i'm going to have him engage in a conversation with the board around how do we go about board development moving forward um and he had some ideas to talk to you about that so yeah no it was a really really positive meeting nice did he ask you did he tell you why we went from Texas to Vermont? He said that, you know, he was, uh, he grew up in, in the military. He was a military family. So moving and was easy for him and that he really loved Vermont and uh, wanted to move here. So. Nice. We're lucky. On that. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, you have my report. I'll just give a, a brief overview. Um, so aligned with our goal around developing and sustaining a comprehensive MTSS, um, we are already starting to think about summer and we have um, a number of school-based teams who are looking at two professional learning uh, opportunities that happen in the summer. Uh, one is the BEST Institute, um, which is hosted by Vermont MTSS, and we have a number of our schools who are uh, looking at um, and are planning on attending that. Um, to think about their PBIS and implementation and their universal social emotional um, system. And so we're excited about, about that. Uh, and we also have some schools who are looking at the Middle Grades Institute, and that's um, sort of in collaboration with the Tarrant Institute. And we have a number of our schools that have been working with, uh, with them. And this is an opportunity to really think about what's, um, what's really unique about those adolescent years and those middle grades and think about how do we um, continue to develop our programming there so that it really responds to students' needs uh, in that age group. So we're excited and to be able to support our schools and 
certainly the additional funding from the from the federal government um, it makes it really um, more possible to sort of su support that participation in a um, in a way. And our our teachers, although fairly uh, exhausted from uh, this challenging year, are excited for you know to kind of switch gears and be able to do that kind of collaborative learning together um, in that in that setting. And so we're excited to be able to support them. Uh, along with our second goal around proficiency-based learning, we, when we finally had a chance to meet for our February meeting, we went over the academic uh, benchmark data that we had gathered in, in January. Following that assessment window, we sent out a sort of a feedback survey to all of our um, teachers just to find out how well the, how well the um, assessment tools that we have are matching sort of their needs in the classroom. You know, if we, as we've talked about sort of all year, that's the the most important use of assessment data is for our teachers and students to be able to use it to, you know, inform uh, teachers to inform their practice, students to inform their own goal setting and know where they're heading in terms of their learning. And so we want to make sure, although we need data that can tell us how our system is doing, we want to make sure that our teachers first and foremost have the, the information they have to support student growth and, and learning. And so we got a lot of good information back from our uh, teachers around those tools. Um, three sort of overarching um, themes that we saw. One, um, teachers, we have a gap in sort of um, uh, assessments that or information that, about foundational literacy skills. So what kind of understanding do our, especially our sort of kindergarten through third grade students have around phonics, phonemic awareness, decoding, those things. We have a lot of teachers um, have tools that they are be able to sort of um, deploy on their own, but not they're not sort of universal across all of our schools. So we're going to um, definitely work to fill in those gaps, use what's working in some schools and make sure other schools have access to it. Um, there's also a lack of vertical alignment in our math assessment. So we use some, something in pre-K, a different thing in kindergarten, and then we pick up another tool in, in first um, grade and up, and teachers were asking for some more consistent data so they could really see student growth and not have to look at those three different. So we'll continue to look at that um, to see what would make, what would help to create um, more consistent information from grade level to grade level. Uh, and then a third uh, theme was just a need for more comprehensive professional learning around the tools and how to use it to improve instruction. Again, we've got teachers who do this, um, you know, and, and don't have, uh, do this very well, have been doing it for years, uh, and other teachers who feel like we're using assessments and not quite sure what information they can get out of it. Um, and so that's certainly an area of focus for us in terms of making sure that, you know, teachers aren't just put doing an assessment, but don't act, don't know how to get that information out of it, and that's that's certainly on us as administrators to make sure they have that learning. So those are our kind of our some of the key sort of overarching themes. It was all open-ended questions, so there's a lot of information there that we are still sussing through, um, but we certainly some action steps we can take from there uh, to improve it. And you may see some changes to the assessment calendar and framework that come out of that, um, and we'll continue to communicate that. But know that our goal is to make sure that the information is as helpful uh, to advance student learning as possible. And that's that what's, what's, what will drive any of those changes. Uh, and then the last piece um, we mentioned a little bit at the last meeting was we have um, our public plan for spending on the um, ARP ESSER funds. That's the American Recovery Plan, uh, Elementary and Secondary Emergency or School Emergency Relief just to get our acronyms defined, but that's the sort of the third tranche of funding that's come out of uh, the federal government related to COVID um, relief and then recovery. And so we uh, had a, a survey go out. We got um, some feedback. I would not say an overwhelming <laughs> amount of feedback. I know people are, are tired of surveys, but every piece of information is helpful and I do think can be representative of more folks as well. And so um, we certainly found support for the way that we have and are planning to spend money around academic support uh, and the uh, increased focus on social emotional learning. Um, I think some there was uh, certainly a push for more focus on hands-on experiential learning, and so we will continue to look at where that um, can be uh, can be expanded. Um, and then questions around how do we, um, how are we specifically supporting students with disabilities so we can be more explicit around that. Uh, and um, we want to keep thinking about how do we support our educators who are, have been doing their best work with students um, and make sure they know that. One of the complexities of this is just this is not the only source of funding. And so trying to communicate everything that we have um, and where, you know, what it's supporting. So in some of the places we are using 
Title IV funding to do what someone was asking ESSER funding to do. So we're just going to be more explicit around that. We've got um, lots of funding around students with disabilities. It doesn't all come from this one one source, but this is the one source that we are supposed to do specific engagement around. So um, we'll just continue to work on communicating all of those pieces as much as possible and, and happy to answer questions as they come up from folks either through board members or from the public more generally. Great. Sorry to keep up. Don, do you have a question? I did. Um, and it has to do with the results of our changes and things to the, the tasks that we're asking our teachers to do. Is there any way that we can get empirical data showing that the changes that we're doing are effective rather than just the anecdotal stuff? Don, can you let me, which changes are you, are you referring well, to? We were talking MTSS. We, we, we said we were doing some changes so we could be more effective. Is there any way that we can get some data to show that rather than just the verbal stuff saying we are? Uh, I think that's a good, yeah, that's a good push. I think, I think some of the, the, yeah, some of the data we'll see in terms of the changes will be what we see in sort of student data, whether that's uh, in their academic data. That's what we looked at in the fall. And then again, in January, we'll look again at that at the end of the year. Um, and then we want to, part of the, what we want to do is be able to look at that more longitudinally. So be able to see what is, what does this data look like a year from now as well? That's, right. yeah. so that's, that's certainly what we'll be looking at. Thank you. Can, can that come to the board members rather than to the principals or is that not what board members are doing these days? Yes. No, I hope to. I, I brought, you know, and I brought data in, 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 Feb, uh, in February, which was ended up being in March. That that was what I hoped when we had it talked to it as a board here for you to be able to see sort of how that um, the changes in the growth. Yeah, we had data last month, Don. Yeah, Meg. Thanks. Yeah, it's funny. I actually I was sitting here with like the opposite question from yours, Don, which is that I think we've seen a lot of empirical data and I was kind of debating whether to raise my hand. And I'm wanting to um, what I wrote down was I um, I love I, I know that our job on this board is to see deliverables, but I also think that student work can be a really powerful um, piece of information and also like the live action formative uh, assessment of just teacher, you know, teachers watching students. So I guess I wanted to just put a plug in for that. And I know I, I'm sure that's something that's going on. But I know and I think that the in these meetings, there's a feeling that there needs to be a report out on on, you know, hard data and numbers. But I want to make sure we don't put too many eggs in the data basket. And instead kind of remember that that formative that live action formative is is really good, powerful stuff. We've got great teachers um, who do good work. That's all. Yeah, no, I think that that's great, Meg. And I think some of where we're seeing that, um, and again, it's just a snapshot, is in the celebrations of learning that we've been doing at each of the districts. Uh, we, I guess, have the benefit of getting to see all of those uh, across all of the districts. Um, and uh, you, would, as individual board members, you may only be seeing the ones that are happening in yours, but it gives us a nice picture of, you know, we saw a pre-K at Rochester and Stockbridge. We saw, I think, um, the fifth grade news in Stratford. We saw third, fourth, third and fourth grade play in Chelsea and Tunbridge. So there's a lot of different ways that um, I think some of that information is coming through and we can continue to think about what other ways to get into the whole board. So you're seeing more, um, more of those snapshots across the SU because it's pretty powerful learning when you when you see, I think we saw the chicken coops in, um, in, in Bethel. Um, so that just uh, really, I think it's a nice, um, a nice combination of all the different kinds of learning that are happening. Um, so we can think about, yeah, making those more, maybe more available to everyone. Thank you. Hi. Um, I want to commend you about using, asking your staff, our teachers, what they think. And it sounds so common sense. Why wouldn't we? In my 30 years of experience in the public sector, it's so rare that <laughs> The senior management asks the people that are delivering the services, what do you think and what can we do differently? I found that they could be very tough markers. Um, 
and I've got some of those things that rah, 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 and other times, you know, I've really had to pick up the pieces, but they're invaluable of what we can learn from. And it sounds like you've, you're doing it. Uh, you are picking up useful information um, that you can uh, move together as a team to, to improve our delivery of our uh, educational performance. And I strongly encourage that you continue to do that. Um, it's, just, it's just a benchmark of this SU. Uh, I just think those organizations that are too afraid to ask are missing out on something. And they say most of the organizations I'm afraid of, either they are too afraid or they don't take it seriously that their staff has something important, valuable that they can contribute. And either way, those are fatal flaws. And I, again, want to uh, commend this SU for, for doing that. And I'm sure you're learning and everybody's going to benefit from that. So thank you. All right. Anyone else? Okay. Well, thank you all thank you yeah good evening everyone so um just to summarize um again we're continuing our professional development opportunities um also starting to plan as onda had mentioned kind of our summer work um and what that will look like and some of our summer work right now um, actually looks like kind of deepening um, what Ando was talking about with kind of the universal assessments um, through some of our, our idea of being our ESSER money, which is different than, um, you know, the ESSER money that's provided to the whole um, SU. Um, ours is just for like our department. Um, I've, I've purchased um, student assessments um, that actually go from pre-K all the way up through 21 plus. Um, these assessments um, are very focused assessments around reading, math, uh, writing. Um, one is kind of a more universal tool and is there subtests for all of the areas, um, even like oral comprehension and motor and things like that. Um, so that um, as Ando was saying about the universal screeners, these can also be used as screeners to dive even a little bit deeper, um, you know, when, when the grade level teams have questions um, about a student's performance or their learner profile. Um, and so our special educators are going to be trained in the early summer um, around all of these assessments, which they've never been trained before. Um, so this is exciting that we can can then dig a little bit deeper to find kind of narrow narrow the um, the narrow the the view of um, the student to kind of even uh, find a more of a targeted um, uh, the gaps in the learning so that you know then we can provide intervention in a more thoughtful way. So I'm excited about all of these um, assessments um, and that training's already been planned for the summer. Um, again, I'm continuing to work uh, with Carrie McDonald, the One Planet Director, for the summer, but I'm also looking to expand um, some of our opportunities to even a greater population of our students. Um, so I've been working with one of our um, certified occupational therapy assistants um, who um, is going to be actually a licensed occupational therapist. Um, to provide kind of a one week um, summer camp experience for um, our students that have uh, motor um, difficulties and um, may not be able to have the opportunity to have a camp experience um, and actually be able to work and interact with other students that are similar to them because our schools are so small we might have one or two students in a building so it'll be nice for them to kind of have like a greater community and get connected um, with some peers that maybe look like them and move like them and have similar equipment to them um, so that they can make those connections so that's exciting um, and also i've started to speak with renee hinton um, our preschool coordinator um, to kind of think about, um, if not for this summer, next summer, um, how to expand some opportunities to our preschool students. Um, 
And then um, for the summer, um, I've been speaking with our alternative, alternative classroom um, special educators about ways that we can continue our so social emotional learning um, for those students in the alternative classrooms throughout the summer. So we're doing some brainstorming about how we can connect, uh, continue to connect with those students and those families, whether it be virtually or in person. We're just trying to think of which way we'll be able to connect with parents more. So they're actually gonna send out a survey to their families um, to see which way um, they think that, you know, they and their, and their children would be able to attend um, more frequently. So that's exciting because um, we know, you know, if they're not available for, for learning, learning doesn't happen. So if we can stay connected with them, then that means they'll be ready to learn uh, when school starts in August. Um, so that's exciting. Um, and then the last part is that we're, you know, continuing to um, hire. It's, it's, uh, it's very busy. Uh, it's, taking, it's taking a lot of time, but I'm so excited about it. Um, to the point where I, now I have almost too many choices, which again, I'm very excited about that. I'd rather have too many choices than, than not enough. Nice. Um, so I'm super, I'm super excited. We've been doing a lot of work um, in our department, but it's all good work and it's all work that's planning for the future. So I'll entertain any questions if anyone has any. Great job. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Okay. Uh, so bring up uh, my report here. Um, information on how we're spending ESSER money in this department to improve Wi-Fi at uh, the buildings. And um, an update on uh, some success we've had filing for E-rate. And then uh, a couple of programs where we're providing service to uh, students to use at home under the Emergency Connectivity Fund and uh, T-Mobile's Project 10 million. And then some details about uh, PEBT and the work that has been done there. And then my favorite part of my report, the boxes of old records we were able to uh, <laughs> notice uh, the photograph. Free up, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, beautiful. In color. Yeah. <laughs> so I will uh, entertain any questions that anyone might have. Virtually or here. Stacy. Hi, Ray. <clears throat> I wanted to hear more about the Wi Fi um, update. Mm -hmm. Does that have to do, I'm, I, my understanding is that all of the buildings have really slick, sexy fiber coming from EC Fiber. Is this update around um, routers and modems, or is this something about infrastructure? So these are the Wi-Fi boxes that are generally in the classrooms. Okay, cool. Right. So the, the buildings that were first on the list had equipment that was no longer supported by the manufacturer and mm -hmm. had reported some problems with connectivity here and there from time to time. So the next phase of that project is gonna include uh, Rochester and Stockbridge where the Wi-Fi boxes in the classrooms are older, although still supported. So we're trying to be a little bit proactive. Awesome. And kind of a related follow-up question. I know that when schools were closed, we had open Wi-Fi access available kind of in parking lots, is that, is that still happening or have we locked down those public networks? No, that's still uh, the case. That equipment was given us given to us by the state for that specific reason, right? So as part of accepting it, we had to provide the uh, available network to support things like um, health services, basically, if, if somebody didn't have another option themselves. So that equipment had to face the parking lot, basically, and be available. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. You ever had a question on the uh, uh, your ECF uh, initiative? Yeah. Families in need of internet service to help with remote learning and quote homework gap situations. How are we doing on that? Is have we closed the gap, or is there is, is that's an impossible goal? But how are we doing on that? 
Uh, well, uh, better over time. Uh, two years ago, we would have had 50 families that had no internet, right? And that specific funding, those devices were working backwards in time, meaning working from the set of people we knew had uh, needs based on uh, COVID quarantining from this year, or students who were part of the Virtual Learning Academy last year, and now back to the shutdown. So uh, I don't have an exact number, but let's say we were at 7% two years ago. Um, and I hesitate to say because I don't know exactly, but I would say we're at 3%. Give or take. That's great. Thank you. Any other questions for Ray? Thank you, Ray. Yeah. Thank you. You all have my report. I have some updates I'd like to share with you since writing it. The first is I have a new accountant that started today. Her name is Ellen Blanchard, and she comes um, to us from several years at Gifford Medical Center as a staff accountant there. So we are very excited to have her on staff. Um, and second, we found out on Friday that Bill H-737 passed the House. And that bill, I'm going to read you a couple of highlights from it is an act relating to the setting the homestead property tax yield and the non-homestead property tax rate. So this is the bill that we anticipate every year. So if this passes the Senate, the property yield, and I'm going to provide this report and I will update all your tax rates in your April board meetings. Um, but at this rate, the property tax yield will be $13,472. The income dollar equivalent yield will be $16,146. And the non-homestead property tax rate will be 1.449 for $100 of equalized education property value. This bill also, as Jamie mentioned at the meeting, I think it was last week or the week before, I have my weeks confused. Um, this bill will also set aside $36 million um, within the education fund as potential funding source for the Universal School Breakfast and Lunch Program. $36 million are applied to lowering the tax rates uniformly across the homestead yield, non-homestead tax rate, and the income yield. And the yields and tax rates we're calculating, assuming changes associated with legislation that is being considered by the General Assembly. So like I said, I'll give you this bill along with uh, your projected updates in your meetings next month. But I just wanted to share that with you. So now if there's any questions. Any questions, anyone? Are you pleased? Very. <laughs> I'm glad we took the conservative route in all of our initial budgets. But this is great news for all of our communities. So this will help with it. Yes. Work. Yeah, tax rates will go down even lower, less than what we have projected. Projected. Very nice. And I'm excited about the universal meals. I think that's definitely the right step forward after what we've experienced the last two years. And you're really excited about you doing a conference. Very excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Yes. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, River Valley Superintendent um, Evaluation Committee. I have tentatively going to set up a date of the 7th for our meeting with Sue. So I'll be sending, watch for an email, those of you who are on the Evaluation Committee. Um, I just got an email back from her on Friday. So um, I will be sending an email out to all of you. Um, April 7th? April 7th, yes. You want to keep them on the calendar? Um, conversation? Yes, and we had a um, conversation about calendars and wagon wheels at our last evaluation committee meeting. Um, so going forward in August, we're looking at um, a wagon wheel type meeting. Um, so there was, there was discussion about two districts um, getting together 
at a time. Um, Stratford and Sharon had done this previously. And so the concept was that we would look at two districts getting together at the same evening and that the meetings might offset uh, an hour. So one might start at 530, one might start at 630. And some of our boards start now at 630 and some start at 530. Um, and so that that was going to be the approach that the committee was suggesting. And we wouldn't start this until August. Um, and then the further concept from that group was, and other members were on here so they can jump in, but was the idea too that the two, the two districts that meet together now might change annually or at least, you know, or every two years just to have different boards get to know each other at a possibly a different level. So that was discussed as well. And Jamie is going to come up with a, a, come up with a calendar yep. for everybody and all the boards to have a chance to look at before we roll it, before we decide on it in August. Don? Yeah, I just would last, I wasn't there at that meeting, so I'd like to ask some consideration about these pairings, maybe be joined towns instead of people having to travel from one end of the district to the other, unless they're uh, going to be over the computer. That is what we talked about, is using geographic location. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Sarah? Well, it seems to me that we could meet in our hometown and do the, the together part virtual. Couldn't we? Rather than travel, so then we could be part of Stockbridge Rochester group sometime, but not have to drive to there. Except, I, I think we can talk about that more, Sarah. But I think the idea was to be able to have Jamie be at our our meeting, and I don't know that. I don't know. Yeah, the plan was still for me to be there in Tara and be able to be in attendance. Certainly, we'll still allow the hybrid option as well, um, but the. The group's initial thoughts were R Sud G Hud together, Sharon Rudd together, F Bud Strafford together was the initial talk for the first incoming year. That wasn't cemented, but that's what was discussed. Well, I just would say I have no problem driving over to Tunbridge to do that. I have a serious problem driving to Stockbridge. <laughs> yeah, no, right. That makes sense. And that's that's what Don. And that was like that's like what Don's point was to try to keep districts. Yeah, but you said that you would change them like every two years, and I'm just, you know I have nothing against Stockbridge except for that it's pretty far away from Stratford. <laughs> but it might be something that, that it might Sarah. be something that we need. Yeah. <clears throat> might be a good point at times. <clears throat> yeah, you could come to Hancock and sleep over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we did think about F Bud could go with Rudd, right? Like there's or Rudd's with our son. Like there's other options too in combinations. So we can switch it around and still kind of keep geographically together. I want you to know I support the concept. I just also I just don't support driving you know, much beyond South Royalton to, to go to a meeting. Right. Well, and I think we're going to have the hybrid option for board members to, to come in. So if you're one that doesn't want to drive, we're going to still make, keep, we're going to try to continue to keep the option that you don't have to. Right. Yep. 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 Okay. yep. Yeah, I just think we get better attendance from our public too mm -hmm. in certain districts by having the hybrid option. Yeah. So unless the board tells me no, my plan was to continue to offer it. Right. <laughs> All right. Um, we had our pol a policy committee meeting tonight. Um, we're coming back and we're going to meet again on the 11th. We're working on um, social media. Yep, social media and, and verification of student residency yep. are two that we're working on at the next meeting on April 11th. Okay, and then we're on to 11.2 school calendar. Uh, so this is the 22-23 uh, school calendar. And so some of the feedback that we've received is, is that over the last few years, based on statute, having to align with our regional tech center. And so for us, our regional tech center is Randolph. Um, that, so that requires three SUs to work together around aligning our vacations. And so um, Onda Adam and Tracy Thompson um, 
facilitated a group that was made up of teachers. Um, actually, we had a board member on it as well um, to start to develop two different versions of a calendar. We call it a calendar A, calendar B. Um, and then we got feedback from the entire admin team and then also from teachers across different districts. And the, the calendar that we settled on was A. And one of the things in this group's work that came out early on was the desire of aligning one vacation to the north and one vacation to the south. And what I mean by that is we still don't have a statewide calendar. Uh, Secretary French, I actually just met with him in this office last Thursday and asked if he thought there was any momentum on that. He said that there's been talk, but the legislature really hasn't tackled it. Um, and so what we've heard is, is that many of our families in our, our towns of Stratford, First Branch, Arsud, um, and Sharon will often have students who might go to a school that uses a Southern calendar, like Hartford, Woodstock, Thetford. And so this calendar now aligns us one vacation to the south and one vacation to the north. Um, and Randolph and CBSU was willing to do that uh, with us. So I think that that's going to be a really well received change um, from our families. And then the calendar does have 14 early release days, which aligns to the support staff master agreement around evening time. Um, and Don, you had a question. I do. Um, in the past, there has been um, the ability to go to the, it was a commissioner, but now it's the, whoever it is, Superintendent French, and ask if we can amend that calendar. And historically, we've always been denied. But now I understand you to say Randolph is going to allow us to change it. Is that what you just said? Yeah, Randolph was willing to work with us on it. So we don't actually have to ask for we don't have to ask for that, Don, because Randolph's okay. they worked with us and agreed to it. Okay, good. So again, one vacations to the south, one's to the north. So yeah. it seemed like it was a it was a good compromise. All right. Any other questions on the calendar? There are no other questions. Um, does someone like to make a motion to accept the calendar? So moved. Is there any more discussion on the calendar? Okay. Hearing none, all those in favor to approve the calendar, say aye. 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 Are there any nays? Right, calendar is approved. Thank you, everyone. I'll have a letter going out this week, and um, folks are already asking for the calendar, so I'm certain that that's included um, as well. Okay, so we have one more topic on our agenda. Yep. Thank you guys all for coming tonight. Mm -hmm. Nice to get to see you. Thank you for signing my <laughs> I'll move to return to public session at 7.42 with no action taken. Second. All right, so moved. We are in public session. Um, so 11.1, um, um, COVID-19 vaccination. Yes, yeah, so... Um, the board, I provided you preliminary data on the current status of our employees in regards to vaccination status. We still have a chunk of unknowns in each district. So Lisa Blair, our HR uh, person, is going to be reaching out to those individuals to get updated information around vaccination status and cards. So next month, I can provide you with an update both on COVID-19 vaccination status for employees, but also our students. Um, we've been trying to update that monthly. So I'll be able to give you the student rates as well in each district. Very good. Any questions? Shannon? And Jamie, again, will that data be with boosters? Can you make sure you know, like if you ask that question? Because our so, a lot of our students are eligible for boosters too. 
Yep. So I will get, I need to go back and look at what the AOE's last guidance around that was, Shannon. Uh, okay. They were giving us definitions of what vaccinated was. And so I'll use whatever that latest version was that they were using. I think it was I different for adults. I just want to make sure we know what we're looking at. So. I think it was different for adults versus students. I think it was booster for adults, um, not for students. But I will get clarity, and that's what we'll report on. Anything else on that topic? Um, like I got you all here. I do want to say great job on on the getting this, the evaluations for superintendent back in. We had really good numbers, so I'm really excited that like I think 25 out of 32 participated, and some of those could be board members that weren't because we were right at our changeover time. So it was a really good number. So thank you everybody for getting that done. Um, resignations, new hires. I'll have a whole list for you next month. There's several still that I need to meet with and finish interviewing because um, I do meet with each person. So next month, I'll have the detailed list to you uh, with names um, in the agenda. I'll have Christy update that. But like Annette said, it's it's coming along really well. So. Thanks. Um, any other business that anybody needs to talk about? Um, Future agenda items we have on your board development series, which Jamie touched on tonight, and formula for WRVSU assessments. Which were there was discussion around that. Yep. Um, and then we'll have COVID 19 vaccination status um, as well. Nice. And our next meeting date is April 25th. Is it really? Happy anniversary. How many? 30. Wow, that's a big one. You shouldn't even be here. <laughs> You're going to get after Matt. What? I don't know if you guys heard, it's Kathy's anniversary on the 25th. I said yeah. she shouldn't even be here. <laughs> we could just we celebrate. Have a co -chair? What? Is there a co-chair and you can... There's a vice chair, but she's I... no longer on the board. And we haven't reorged yet. Wait, um, who's... Who? I think it was Lisa Floyd, if I remember right. Yeah. Lisa Floyd is no longer on the board? Yeah, no, she, she did not run it, Rudd. Yeah. So we have a vacancy to fill. Well, we'll reorg in June. Yeah. In the meantime, we have an anniversary party to plan. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Is there anything else tonight, guys? I move to adjourn. Second. So move, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.